Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Brooke Oliveri. I am the manager at the Long Island Health Collaborative. Uh, we work with the New York Coalition for Transportation Safety to bring you the Walk Safe Long Island initiative, all about bike and pedestrian safety. And today we will be focusing on the area around Hop Hog Public Library, as you can see here. So just a little more information about each of our respective organizations. The New York Coalition for Transportation Safety advocates for pedestrian and bike safety throughout New York State. And the Long Island Health Collaborative, we are an organization of many organizations across Long Island, all invested in improving the health of Long Islanders. So before we get to the program today, I'm going to introduce our panel. First up, we have Cindy Brown. She is the executive director of NYCTS, the New York Coalition. Also on the panel is Mark Hoffacker, program director at NYCTS. We're also joined by Lowell Wolf, program director at the coalition. And two very important team members behind the scenes, Lynn Margaret Brown and Liz Lee. And without further ado, please take it away, Cindy. All right. Um, the reason that we want to do a public workshop on pedestrian and bicycle safety is because the number of injuries that are being incurred by pedestrians and bicyclists, uh, mostly at the hands of motorists, uh, have increased tremendously in the last few years. So as part of our goal, we want to educate pedestrians and bicyclists about the state laws that exist to protect them um, from being injured by a motor vehicle. And we also want to give you some best practices information to help you stay safe because there's two people involved in a crash, the person who uh, is injured and the person who is driving the vehicle. So both people, the motorist and the pedestrian or bicyclist really need to know the laws if this is going to work best for everybody and prevent injuries. We also want to familiarize you with um, much of the new electric powered transportation devices that are now coming on the road, like e-bikes, scooters, and mopeds, which are also referred to as micro mobility devices. And they have a tremendous impact on pedestrian safety as they proliferate because uh, we're not used to them and they're new and there's gonna be a real learning curve. And we wanna help you to recognize how COVID-19 has impacted traffic safety. Next. All right, this is just to prove our point on why you need a pedestrian safety program and bicycle safety program. These are a brief list of the number of people in the last six to eight weeks who have been injured uh, in a motor vehicle crash. Uh, you can see that it ranges from drunk driving, uh, pedestrians on a roadway, uh, uh, hit and runs, many, many hit and runs. Half the crashes we see are hit and runs, probably more than half. Uh, people who are sitting someplace like a bus stop and get hit by a car that jumps the curb and they range from all ages, from older adults to children. Next. All right, again, just to prove the point on why we need this kind of uh, education is uh, this is an article that appeared that uh, shows us that pedestrian deaths are on pace for record increase despite less driving. And that's for 2020, the year that uh, at right up till now, uh, although the whole world seems to have come back about two weeks ago. Uh, pedestrian deaths are just surging around the country. Uh, there were less cars on the road, but there were actually more people and more bicyclists on the road just for exercise and to get out of the house when we were so confined. And so now state and local governments are trying to enact new programs uh, aimed at uh, improving pedestrian safety. The um, Transportation Research Safety Board, I believe, came out with new guidelines today, really, really, really stressing how redesign of roads has got to change. It has to take into effect uh, how, how people are getting around now, how it really is going to be, whether it's because of the environment issues or whatever, 
going to be finding uh, other methods of transportation just besides cars. Uh, also, pedestrians were at a higher risk of being hit by a car during the pandemic because, and unfortunately, the habits that were that drivers uh, developed during the pandemic have not all gone away. And so now we have increasing traffic and we have uh, motorists driving at much greater speeds than they did prior to the uh, epidemic. And it's not really being particularly enforced by police departments. Next. And also, Cindy, I just um, as some of those headlines said is um, big increase in hit and runs um, uh, over the past few years, especially the past year, partially during the pandemic, um, you know, there weren't that many people on the street. There weren't people witnessing, you know, if a pedestrian or a cyclist was struck. So, you right. know, unfortunately too many cars just drove off because nobody saw it. So a big hit and runs in that last article, um, just to reiterate the point of larger vehicles, you know, there's a lot um, more SUVs, pickup trucks, and if they're driving fast and you're hit by one of them, the uh, chance of a fatality is much greater. You're, you're hitting a different spot in your body, you know, with these larger vehicles and uh, pretty deadly. Thanks. Uh, also, in a, in a different forum, we had a discussion on uh, who is the hit and run driver. And in many instances, it's been discovered that in addition to possibly being um, uh, inebriated, they also have had a tremendous number of license suspensions. Mm -hmm. And these can be for anything from ha not having paid their car insurance to tickets that went unpaid and you know any number of things. And in some instances, they have more than 20 license suspensions and nobody's really doing anything about it. So uh, that's something else that needs to be investigated. And it's one way to get some of these you know, dangerous drivers off the road. In the meantime, the laws that we're going to talk about, these are New York State laws. They appear in the Vehicle and Traffic Law, which is a multi, multi, multi-paged book that contains all the information that needs to be enforced by uh, police departments when um, either through inspections or uh, when they're monitoring the roadway for people who are driving. So cross streets at marked crosswalks or intersections, that's where it's safest for the pedestrian to cross. Motorists have the right of way at all locations other than intersections and marked crosswalks. So that's why it's really important that you try to cross where you see the road has been set, you know, marked for your safety. Uh, drivers have to yield to a pedestrian in a crosswalk at an unmarked crossing. However, I would highly advise that you make certain that the driver is aware that you are trying to cross there. And if he doesn't give you the right of way, I wouldn't uh, force the subject, just wait. You should always obey the walk, don't walk signs. Those signs are there on the traffic signals, again, to tell you when it's safe for you to cross. You should always walk on the sidewalk if there is one and walk facing traffic if there is no sidewalk. The law says that you have to walk, when there's no sidewalk, you have to walk facing traffic. Pedestrians have the right of way when a car is pulling in or out of traffic across a sidewalk. That would be a driveway that's pulling out of a private house or a, uh, a shopping center or a gas station, any place where there's driveways that exit onto the street. Uh, pedestrians are not allowed on limited access roads such as expressways and interstates, nor are they allowed on entrance or exit ramps for those roads. I realize that sometimes this is not possible if the car breaks down or you get a flat tire, but you should get as far off the roadway as possible before you attempt to uh, fix your vehicle. Next. All right, so okay. uh, a little bit about your specific library. So as you can see, Hop Hog Library is located right on Vets Highway there. Um, and it is within this kind of industrial complex. Um, so your library is really, it's beautiful and it's a great resource centrally located right there. Um, however, it is a very busy street there on Vets Highway. It's uh, about four lanes there. So that's certainly something to be mindful of. Um, so as you can see here, we just have a few other pictures of the front entrance 
you have a nice bike rack there right out front. So if you are cycling to the library, there is a place to securely store your bike. Um, but this is a very large parking lot. And actually the Long Island Health Collaborative is located in this parking lot as well. So I'm very familiar with it. And especially at the start of business hours and the end of business hours, it can get a little bit busy in that parking lot, which is something really to be mindful of as a pedestrian and as a patron when you're going to your library. Yeah, let me just reinforce, Brooke, that, um, you know, I think the title is staying safe on the streets, but that parking lots are dangerous. A lot of uh, people do get hit. You may not die. It may not be a fatal necessarily, but people are speeding into the parking spots. There's children walking around, running around. There's no crosswalks. Um, so think about parking lots, too, in terms of uh, your safety in a parking lot. Absolutely. And here we just have a little screenshot from Google Maps to give you a better idea of, you know, the, the traffic and the magnitude of Vets Highway there right out front. And there is no crosswalk there at the light, although there is a traffic light. It's, you know, it really could be dangerous to cross there. So definitely something to keep in mind. Does a bus run along here? Um, you know, I'm not sure about that. I would think there would be, considering it's like a very high traffic area, but that's something to look into, perhaps. I think there might be a SCAT uh, route that goes along part of veterans. So, yeah, I believe so. I mean, the, what you're seeing in that picture, just on the one side, is actually five lanes. There's five lanes. Yes. And I don't know how many lanes are on the other side. you got a small pedestrian island. And Fortunately, finish, yeah, crosswalk. You, you do have that crosswalk and you do have, uh, there's a small, looks like there's a small pedestrian uh, sidewalk near the library. Um, for what that's worth, that's good. But unfortunately, to cross the street, it uh, looks like there are few and far between uh, intersections right. that make it safe. So this was about moving cars, <laughs> the design of that road. Yes, yeah, definitely. Well, speaking of pedestrians, uh, these next two slides are kind of interesting. Uh, paradox here. We have two situations. Um, and as it's stated, do you feel safe walking in your neighborhood? Well, we already discussed uh, where the library is located. Hop Park has many industrial parks. And as Cindy just brought out, the fact that uh, these areas were quite often made for mobility uh, of motor vehicles to get vehicles through quickly. And sometimes pedestrians are unfortunately uh, not considered part of the picture when it comes to planning for communities, especially in the past. <clears throat> what you see here in these two photos, uh, the one on the left is a very good example of a pedestrian friendly location. Uh, everyone is abiding by the rules by crossing at the intersection. The intersection is clearly painted. There is signage for motorists uh, as well as for pedestrians. Something else that's very important, um, folks here, and of course we can't always do this, but folks are walking in a group. Uh, there's strength in numbers in a sense when it comes to pedestrians. They are more visible when there are many together, when there's a cluster of people crossing, much more visible for motorists to see them. Unfortunately, the situation on the right is a little bit different. We have a few problems here. Uh, apparently we have a pedestrian who's walking with a pet who may be physically challenged. She has a walker. Uh, there are obviously no sidewalks there. Uh, another problem, she's walking, as a result of no sidewalks, she's forced to walk in the road. Another problem, uh, which uh, may be something that she needs to address in the future, she should be facing the oncoming traffic. As Cindy pointed out earlier, pedestrians by law are supposed to go uh, in the opposite direction of the traffic when there are no sidewalks. And the reason, the logic behind this is you are more observable to the uh, vehicle operator. You can make eye contact with the vehicle operator. So uh, that picture on the right is, uh, has, has several issues that should be addressed. One of them, uh, again, the individual should be uh, going not with the traffic, but against the traffic. And unfortunately that location does not have uh, a sidewalk. The infrastructure is not there to make it pedestrian uh, safe, pedestrian friendly. 
Next slide, please. Okay, and to uh, further this issue, what would make you feel safer as a pedestrian? And again, we have uh, two photographs, uh, virtual locations, uh, except the one on the left has no sidewalk. Uh, the one on the right has built-in sidewalks. And obviously, most individuals who are going to be pedestrians would feel much safer with uh, the situation on the right side. Uh, again, the infrastructure is there. There's a definitive location where both motorists and pedestrians know pedestrians are safe to be walking. Uh, there's uh, no area where pedestrians need to walk into the roadway. Much safer situation with the sidewalks. So again, um, wherever possible, and I think most newer areas that are being developed now, uh, planned and developed, include sidewalks with that in mind, the fact that uh, it's much safer for pedestrians. They feel safer uh, psychologically and physically. They are much safer when they have that barrier, that separation, that curb. Uh, unfortunately, there are many areas, however, that were developed uh, in Long Island, especially as you go further out uh, into Suffolk County, where we don't have that infrastructure in place. We don't have the sidewalks. So safety is always a concern. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have some pedestrian safety recommendations. Uh, make sure to push the button to get the walk icon. Now, again, we had mentioned before that pedestrians do have the right of way when it comes to intersections. And fortunately, we do have a number of intersections where there are those uh, cross push buttons. There are various types of buttons out there. Some of them give uh, the, the walker, the pedestrian, advanced time to walk. They actually provide additional few, a few, an additional few seconds for the uh, pedestrians across the street. Some of them are just going to, if you don't push the button, you're not gonna get the walk sign. So there are various ones out there, but always make sure you push that button if there's one available. Once the walk icon comes on, you may now cross the street, but be sure to watch for turning vehicles. Turning vehicles, very dangerous. Many of them cannot necessarily see you, and of course, with so many distractions these days between COVID, people using electronic equipment, their, their cell phones, you're not always sure that just because you have the right of way as a pedestrian that you're safe. Uh, in particular, be aware that trucks and buses cannot always see a pedestrian who is close to them. So try to signal the driver of this type of vehicle that you are crossing in front of them. Uh, what happens is quite often you would think, hey, you know, a bus, a truck, a truck, you know, these operators of those vehicles, they have the high ground. They should be able to see everything. Unfortunately, though, quite often they are focused on looking at the long range. Uh, they may not actually have a good view of what's in their immediate vicinity. The point here is don't assume just because they're high up that they could see you. Try to wave a hand try to make eye contact, whatever it takes. But if you are going into a crosswalk and there is a vehicle making a turn, in particular, uh, a, a high vehicle, try to make sure that they see you, that they know that you're in front of them. Uh, if you walk slowly or require the use of a cane or a walker, uh, it, you know, usually uh, individuals might be physically challenged or the elderly, uh, you should always wait for a fresh green signal uh, before crossing. In other words, if you are at a signal where there's a countdown, countdowns are great. But if you see that you're getting down to the last few seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and you're crossing a multi-lane road or highway, don't take, you know, don't, don't take the risk. Wait. Your, your life may depend upon it. Wait and just go through the next cycle. Finally, uh, we hear so much about inebriated uh, vehicle operators, drunk drivers, in essence, or people under the influence. Well, quite often pedestrians, especially in areas where there may be a downtown, uh, certain days of the week where there are bars located, pedestrians also could be drunk. And quite often pedestrians may not have their full senses about um, their surroundings. And when they're crossing into the street, they could very easily become victimized by being hit by a vehicle. So just like with driving, rethink drinking and walking. It might sound a little corny, it might sound kind of strange, but it's true. 
if you're in an area that's busy where there's a lot of traffic and if you are uh, a little tipsy, be careful, be careful out there. Next slide, please. Okay, we have here some other roadway designs and devices that can make it easier and safer for you to cross the street, for pedestrians to cross the street. Uh, one of them, the first one I'd like to talk about is called a road diet. Road diets are made to reduce vehicle speeds and uh, also they reduce the number of lanes that pedestrians have to cross. So they sort of reduce uh, the amount of walking for pedestrians and in doing so that reduces the number of lanes for vehicles and that in effect slows traffic down. So it might make the uh, vehicle operators a little annoyed that they have to slow down but it's a safety factor. Pedestrian refuge islands, we alluded to that a little bit earlier when we looked at Veterans Highway. Uh, there are many locations where there are large streets with multi uh, lanes that have these uh, refuge islands. Very important because they allow pedestrians a safe place to stop midpoint in a roadway. Again, this is particularly important for um, those who are physically challenged, the elderly, uh, those who are just out on a day like today where it feels like 100 plus degrees and you need to rest a little bit. Those uh, pedestrian refuges, they, those islands come in handy. Another um, trick that um, engineers and planners are putting together. Uh, it's known as raised crosswalks. What they do is they reduce vehicle speeds by physically notifying the, the vehicle operator that you're in a different location. You could feel while you're driving that you're in a raised area or the surface may be different. And that is a way of cluing the uh, vehicle operator to slow down, to let them realize uh, they are in a crosswalk area and pedestrians may be there, slow down. Uh, a couple of other uh, improvements and ways to make it safer for pedestrians. Crosswalk visibility enhancements, such as crosswalk lighting, um, also enhanced signage, very important, both for vehicle operators as well as for pedestrians. Finally, uh, we talked again a little bit about this on the previous slide, LPIs or leading pedestrian intervals. Again, when you have those buttons available, quite often uh, you will have at signalized intersections a few extra seconds by just pressing the button, which lets the traffic signals know that a pedestrian is there. Uh, they could provide you, not every one of them, by, mind you, but many of the newer, newer intersections with the buttons, with these traffic systems. If you press that button, you will get about another three or four seconds of time to cross before turning signals for vehicles come, come on. So if a vehicle is going to make a, uh, has an arrow or a green light to make a left or a right turn, you'll have a few extra seconds before that light goes on for them to cross. Quite often you'll see that at intersections where you'll see a walk sign flash and you still as a motor vehicle operator still have a red light or uh, you don't have a green arrow yet and yet the walk sign is on. After about three or four seconds, at that point, then the arrow goes on. Again, this is a way to buy a little bit extra time for pedestrians to safely cross the street. So again, these are examples of some of the uh, techniques being used to make intersections a little bit more safer for pedestrians to cross. But again, ultimately, it's the responsibility of the pedestrian uh, you know, don't challenge a car that's going really fast because they're going to win when it comes to bumping into you. You're going to sustain more injuries than that vehicle will. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to go over some of the laws re related to cycling. Um, and as Cindy mentioned before, here is this is New York State Vehicle and Traffic Law and this section here. There's a lot of laws in here related to bicycles. Like reading. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's good, you know, if you got nothing else to read. Um, first of all, before we go through laws, I think, I think it's helpful if you ride a bike. It's a lot of fun. But think of your bicycle as a vehicle. It's an unmotorized vehicle most of them are we'll talk about you know electric bikes in a few minutes but it's a vehicle so therefore when you go out into traffic um you have to follow all the laws that are in here just like when you drive 
But, you know, when people buy, they don't necessarily know all the laws. So the first bullet, you, you have to know the laws related to cycling. And the first is that you um, you have to stop at a stop sign, just like a car, a red light or a yield sign. Most people don't, but technically cyclists are supposed to obey the same laws as, as a car would do. Um, you, if you're riding on the street, if you're in your older teens or an adult and you're riding, you're not riding on the sidewalk, you know, think of sidewalks, they're for pedestrians and young children riding bikes. They're not for us adults riding our bikes. Um, but you ride with traffic the same way that cars are going. That's different than pedestrians, you know, where the pedestrian wants to make eye contact with the driver. But because we're a vehicle, uh, we go the same way that the cars are. And, and the cars, most of the time, are expecting you to be riding that way. Uh, in terms of helmets, uh, New York state law says that children under the age of 14 and over the age of one have to wear a helmet or else the parent or guardian can get a summons. It's a $50 summons. You can fight, not fight, but if you buy the, the child uh, a helmet before actually going to court, it'll be taken away. Nassau County, uh, a little more than a year ago, changed that law. So Nassau County law is under the age of 18, over the age of, of one. And that shows you that localities can make some of their own laws. And I say that because in Suffolk County, probably three, four months ago, Suffolk County was the first county in New York State to pass what's called the three-foot law, which says that when we are driving and we are passing a cyclist, we have to give that cyclist at least three feet. If we extend our arm out, we should be giving us that, that amount of room. I think it's a good law. Um, it may be hard to enforce, uh, but I think the concept is... Uh, respect for the cyclists, you know, and we're sharing the road and they need a little bit of space. We can't just go right next to them because if someone opens their door, we'll talk about dooring in a minute, um, you know, they're very unprotected. So by giving them three feet and there are efforts being tried to, to make that a state law, but Suffolk was first. So I give you a lot of credit for that. Next. So a few other laws sort of maybe relating to your bikes, or some of these are relating to your bikes. Um, you are supposed to, by law, have a white reflector in the front of your bicycle and a red reflector in the rear. And again, if you think of your car, you've got headlights in the front, which are white. You have red in the back is a, a brake light. So there, there's a continuity there between vehicles. You also additionally are supposed to have spoke reflectors in your wheel and spoke reflectors are very helpful because they're moving you know and if a car is perpendicular to you they you know they can catch those because your wheels are moving as well as the reflectors your pedal reflectors usually yellow orange-ish on the bottom front and back they're they're also moving those reflectors when you're pedaling and um, they're very helpful at night for cars because car lights go down a little bit. They don't go straight ahead. There's more light going down, you know, to see the road. So they might catch those reflectors. They may help you be seen. Just to dry, uh, go jump to that third, if you are riding at night, it's dark outside. Uh, you also have to have a light, a white light in the front that projects at least 500 feet. I, I don't know how they enforce that, but that's actually if the law says that, and the red light in the back has to um, project, I believe, 200 feet. So, look, a lot of children, first of all, don't even understand the difference between a reflector and a light. So um, that's a bit of a problem, but I mean, hopefully children aren't riding in the dark necessarily. And one thing I'd say about lights, and um, we'll talk about visibility when we talk about tips. What I see a lot of cyclists now, I quote good cyclists, I'd say, they put their lights on even during the day. You see the white light in the front, the red light in the back. It might be a flashing red light. It's a split second more of visibility for the cyclists. I put my lights on my car when I drive during the day. 
you know, it, it gives you a little more visibility. New York state law says when you're riding out in the streets, you're riding with the friends, the, the two of you can ride side to side. Um, it, you're, you're riding over as far to the right as you possibly can. Um, but if a car is starting to pass, you're supposed to go single file. Probably, you know, and, you know, cyclists, just like pedestrians, break law, and like drivers, break laws. I would say probably the most um, egregious violation of that are like a lot of the bike clubs, you know, there's 20 people riding together. They sometimes take over the whole street. Usually maybe on Sunday mornings, there's not, not as much traffic, but they're technically breaking the law. That is, you can't take up the whole street, you're sharing the street. And a little known, a little known law is um, you have to have a bell or horn on, on your bike. Again, think of a car, you know, you honk your horn. I just got a new bike. It's kind of, um, I put like this old fashioned bell on it. So I was riding my bike in the park yesterday. This was funny. There were three females that were taking up the whole, you know, little path that I was on. They weren't leaving any space. So I rang my bell. And they all started cracking up, you know, they're like, oh, I haven't heard that bell. You know, we think of it when we're kids, but that's technically the law. You're supposed to have a bell on your bike. You know, I could have yelled at them, but I'd rather just, you know, ring my bell and they got a kick out of it. Next. So let's talk about bike helmets. Um, it's one thing to have a helmet. I'm going to try to show you my own helmet. But we, we spend a lot of time with um, at events doing uh, helmet fittings to make sure that it, it fits correctly. And there's basically three points to make that um, it's, it's got to come down over your forehead. And you should, we generally tell people, children, um, you want to get about two fingers from your eyebrows to the bottom of the helmet. This, my helmet here, I don't know how well you see it, but this is technically, it's a bike helmet. It's not a multi-sport helmet. There's different types of helmets. It's an adjustable. Um, and especially a lot of children, they have helmets that are too small. You know, if it's on the top of my head, it's not protecting. So I adjusted adjustable helmets are very good for children, you know, because, um, you know, their heads are still growing. Hopefully my head won't grow anymore. But so I make it as big as I can. Now these little um, plastic tabs on the side, which are on the straps, they slide up and down. They should be at the bottom of your ear. It's kind of like a V. And then when you clip your helmet on, especially with children, teach them that a little bit, pull it down. Nobody wants to, because that hurts when you, if, if if you get clipped there on your skin. But you're supposed to get about one finger between the strap and your chin so the helmet is tight enough. So if you're moving around, you know, a lot of people wear them too loose. A lot of people, actually, I think more adults, they, they ride like this, it's not even clipped on, you know, or, or it's back like that. So, you know, we find a lot of children, maybe 10 year olds had their first helmet or I don't know, an old helmet and it's too small. You know, they have to um, get a new one. Your helmet, if you haven't used one in a while, it should have a sticker on the inside. There'll be a date there. It'll tell you how long it is. If you've got a 20 year old helmet, get replace it. Helmets are not necessarily expensive. And if it has been, if you have fallen off the bike or somehow or another, you know, it's sort of been in a, a bit of a crash, replace it. There could be a fracture in there. It's not going to be as effective. And probably I should have mentioned it first. Um, you know, we're talking about the law under the age of 14, but everybody should wear a helmet. Helmets are very effective in reducing your risk of brain injury because that's the energy of your fall gets absorbed into the helmet, you know, not, not into your... Um, your skull, you know, or your brain. Next. And just a few words um, about infrastructure. You know, Lowe was showing you sidewalks for pedestrians. So in some cases on the road, there are bike lanes, like the, the lane on the left, there's a lot of them in Suffolk County. You know, it's really just kind of a shoulder, but um, it has been painted and it says bike lanes. So you know, you're supposed to be there, it's a little bit safer, it's designating you, but you really are unprotected from cars that are driving on your left. That that car, 
in the picture on the left is actually breaking the law. The law says you can't park in a bike lane. If I was riding there because of that car, I'd have to go out into traffic, you know, which would endanger me a little bit. But that's so that's an unprotected bike lane. And you do have um, a good number of them in Suffolk County on major roads, like maybe Motor Parkway. I don't think it, I'm probably not Veterans Highway there, but um, that's an unprotected bike lane. What we would recommend or what you're seeing more in terms of street design today, and this is a more recent example, is the picture on the, the, the right, which is close to Hopaw, 347, which is a major thoroughfare. So when they redid that road, I don't know what, four or five years ago, maybe. Yeah. They, yeah. you see this bike lane, it's, it's, it's called off-road. So you're riding your bike there, you're not riding with traffic. So you're protected, the space, you know, they designated space, it's safe for cyclists. I don't know for sure, but I've got to believe, first of all, it's a major thoroughfare, which probably nobody used to ride their bike on 347 when there was no bike lane. So now I'll bet you those businesses on 347 are very happy to have that bike lane, you know, because bike lanes are proven to increase local economic activity. And I, I think I remember when they were building this, that some of the homeowners complained but people find if you have a, a bike lane right next to your home, it actually increases the value of, of, of your house. So that's a good thing. You know, Mark, I just want to comment. Uh, this just happened yesterday, and I only read it this morning. I don't know exactly where north-south this picture is of 347, but uh, and I do not know if this bike protected bike lane or off-road bike lane extends the entire uh, length of the road. But there was a bicyclist struck here yesterday um, at 347 and Route 112. Wasn't fatal, but I was wondering if it could be that this protected lane ended and it threw it back, you know, you were thrown back onto the street. Well, my hunch would be, I hadn't read about that myself, but you still have to cross perpendicular streets. You know, you've got this bike lane here, right. but you're going to come to cross streets. So my hunch, unless a car actually drove up into the bike lane, which can yeah, happen, didn't unfortunately, it might have <laughs> been when the cyclist, and there would have been, you know, some painting on the road, probably a sharrow showing you that there are cars and bikes at the same spots. So I, my, I would make a wager that it happened while somebody was crossing the street. And... Maybe that cyclist, you know, I'm not, not to blame it. Maybe they were going pretty quick and just went onto the street without like stopping or yielding, you know, like maybe they should have. So, or, or the car was going really fast and hit them. That's interesting. But I, yeah, I, I just happened to see it this morning and I was pretty sure our presentation was 347. It was yeah. on the north side because it was Port Jeff Station. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, Alice, at Route 112, I, I'm not sure, but I don't think it extends that far out, the bicycle okay. uh, dedicated bike pass on I'm the 347. Sure. I'm not 100% sure about that. Yeah. That's pretty far out east, 112. Right. Next. And just um, a few comments. You know, riding your bike uh, out in traffic, you know, there are special skills to it, follow the laws. Just to show you very common occurrence, both of these pictures, um, people who cycle a lot, you know, on the streets can get doored. This, you know, the picture on the right especially shows you if you're going really close to the car. You know, if I was riding, if I'm in that situation, I'm, I'm, I'm riding slow on my bike and I'm trying to look and see, is there a person sitting in that car, you know, uh, in the driver's seat? And if they are, I would slow down even more because they might just open their door. So you see uh, instances of what's called dooring. The picture on the left is also kind of interesting to me in that, um, well, with your new law. Like, I bet you that if that cab, depending on how fast they're going, they may not even be able to give that cyclist three feet. So maybe they'd have to slow down. Look, if it was me, because you know, I probably wouldn't have tried to pass that parked car. I probably would have waited to all that traffic passed. Then I would have moved out, you know, into the situation, into the 
into the uh, you know driving lane you know possibly but actually both neither of these so we actually see a, a bike lane you know where they're, they're given space uh, to cyclists and don't well we'll actually talk a little bit more but another law is um it says alert if you're riding on a bike just like a car you can only have at a, a max one earbud in you have to have at least one ear free so if this taxi's honking at you you, you know, you got to hear that, don't, and you do see a lot of cyclists with headphones on, um, unfortunately, well, I would say unfortunately, I just made, but a lot of cyclists put their cell phone on the handlebar, sometimes they're following a route, you know, like a GPS route, but again, to me, that's, it's distracting them, you know, a little bit, taking their eyes off the road. Next. All right, these are some of the uh, new devices we mentioned early on in the presentation. Um, they're known as uh, e-mobility devices. They have three things in common. They're motorized, but that's by a battery. Uh, generally speaking, they go low speed, but that's not necessarily true of mopeds, which can go upwards of 30 miles an hour. And they're not large. Uh, and so here's just a couple of examples. The one you see the battery pack on the bicycle is the black uh, case on the bar, uh, the hoverboard, it's built in the battery, and the uh, scooter is also uh, operated on a battery. Uh, these devices have become extremely popular, um, even for the scooters in particular, a lot of younger people, including children, use these. Uh, recently, I understand there's been a real rise in theft of them because they're, as I said, there's young people riding them and young people who are somewhat older than the children who are on the scooters uh, can, you know, relinquish it because they can't really uh, uh, defend themselves. So the biggest feature of these, aside from the fact that they get you around, is that they don't make any noise. And that's fine if you're the person who's on the device, but if you're a person who is walking or even another car, you are just not aware that these vehicles are coming at you. You don't hear them. So you have to really look and be very careful. And the other main problem is that because they're so new, most of what we talk about here with laws that um, are intended for the safety of pedestrians and bicyclists, do not apply to these vehicles. They are not incorporated into existing laws. There nope. has been some effort in New York City, uh, but uh, <clears throat> otherwise the law making them legal only uh, came on the books last April, uh, April a year ago. So there, there needs to be a lot of um, thought put into where these vehicles can ride. Uh, they are definitely not allowed on the, the bicycle. Uh, and the moped are definitely not allowed on sidewalks, but I understand that many people with e-bikes are riding them on the sidewalk, and an e-bike can achieve speeds of 25, 30 miles an hour. So the compatibility between these and pedestrians is weak at most. So I just, you know, just keep your eyes open. Uh, also, um, they don't necessarily abide by uh, one-way signs. So you may be looking for a, you know, a device that's coming the way you think the street is going, but they're actually coming the other way because mopeds in particular are really used by people who use them for business or delivery services. So you have to- You know, Cindy, yes. one, of the, one other thing about the, uh, you, you mentioned mopeds being fast and, and those motorized bicycles being fast, but, um, Another problem about the motorized bicycles, unless you really observe them closely, you may not realize that they're motorized and you That's might not true. expect them to be going as fast as they actually are. Right. That could be kind of a, a scary situation for, for anyone who deals with, you know, who sees one of these approaching. Right. The only good thing with the hoverboard is they don't go very fast. And, right. you know, you it requires balance and there's nothing else to hold on to. So you know, unless they're kids that are doing tricks on them or whatever, they're, they're not as likely to be uh, a problem for uh, pedestrians as the other new devices. Next. All right, so this is 
these are not necessarily laws. These are just recommendations that we want to offer you as, you know, if you're walking as a way of keeping yourself safe. Again, we want to say always walk on the sidewalk when there is one. When there isn't, this is a law. You should walk facing traffic. Cross streets at corners or in crosswalks. That's why they're created for you. That's why they're there. That's where drivers look for you. That's where all the signs are indicating that pedestrians are crossing. Uh, we recommend that to be safe, you be seen. So you wear brightly colored clothing. If not, you can get yourself one of these little vests, particularly uh, when you go into daylight savings time or Eastern Standard Time and the hours of daylight change. And that's really one of the most uh, dangerous times of the year in the early fall when we have way less daylight hours and it's a hard time for drivers to see. So these little things fold up, some of them even come in a pack, you can keep them with you. If you walk to and from your main method of transportation, be it a train or a bus, and you have a walk to get to where you live, you might wanna think about this if it, you know that it's uh, beginning to get dark. You should never text or talk on your cell phone when you're crossing a street or riding a bicycle. And New York state law also says that you are not allowed to text while you're driving. Unfortunately, unless you're sitting and not moving as many people interpret that to be if they're sitting at a traffic signal. That's not necessarily true, but it happens all the time. And so if you are trying to cross the street and talk on your cell phone and the motorist is busy texting on his cell phone at the same time, it's just an opportunity for a crash. Uh, when you're walking or bicycling at night, again, it's a good idea to wear these reflective garments. And if you don't have any of those, you can get reflective stickers, you can get reflective tape, you can get anything that just makes you more visible. I mean, if it's raining and you've got on your black raincoat and carrying your black umbrella, nobody can see you. Uh, also, if you don't want to use this uh, reflective vest or something of the, this nature, you can use your cell phone when, if you're walking home, again, from uh, your method of transportation to and from a business, um, use the flashlight on your cell phone. It's like a beacon. It lights up the sidewalk for you. Uh, it would make you see if there's some place that the sidewalk's broken up or when the curb is coming up or even if there is a curb. So that's another thing that you can do to help keep yourself safe while you're walking. Next. So some tips for bicyclists. Um, first of all, let me make two points and we'll look at some of the bullets is when you're riding in traffic, I think what's, one thing that's very important is to be a consistent rider. You know, don't, don't speed up and slow down because cars are assessing you. They look at you and they make an assumption. You know, when I see a child on a bike, if they're on the street, I'm going to slow down a little bit because I know a child, their bicycling skills may not be so good. When I see a guy wearing an Italian bike thing, um, he's got the lights on, he's got a, a $4,000 bike, I'm going to assume he's probably going to be going a little bit faster than, than usual. Um, but be consistent. Be consistent when you ride your bike. And the second point of um, make, make sure your bike is in good working order. We... Um, give out information on ABCs. ABC would be air. Make sure your tires are pumped up to the maximum pressure and tires lose air over time. It just happens. So once or twice a year, maybe three times, you do have to pump up your tires. It's safer. It's more comfortable, more efficient for your bike, but it's also uh, safer. You're more likely to get a flat if, you, uh, if your tires don't have good air. B is your brakes. Check them, make sure you know how your brakes work. If you have two hand brakes, when you're stopping, you're supposed to use both hand brakes. Don't just use one. The uh, right is the rear brake, the left is the front. Let's say you're just braking, you know, on the left, you're stopping the front, you know, your bike can jolt a little bit. So know how your brakes work and make sure they're in good working order. C is for the chain, make sure it's greased. You know, I would make the point of, um, Cycling, as people know, it's, it's getting hard to buy a bicycle. Um, they're in demand. People are probably taking out their own bicycle, old bicycles, maybe in the garage. So, uh, you know, check it out yourself. 
get a tune up. Tune ups are not necessarily that expensive, just like you tune up your car. You don't have to tune up uh, a bike every year, but maybe you bring it to a bike shop and make sure it's in good working order. So, um, you know, I want to make on the second bullet point list, just to reinforce about turning vehicles, um, the most dangerous move we make as motorists is the left turn. There's a lot of research that shows that sometimes there are aggressive left turns. We speed up, our eyes are pointed in a different way. So therefore, when I'm a pedestrian or I'm a cyclist, I'm especially looking for those people making the left turn. You know, the light's yellow, so they're trying to beat it. So they're, they're um, making a quick left turn. I'm not going to, you know, start in the crosswalk. I'm not going to ride my bike. I'm going to be very vigilant about uh, left turns. You got a bell. Um, you're actually, the law actually says at least, <laughs> at least one of your brakes has to, to work. You have to have good working brakes. The, it, there's um, a several section of the law about children are more likely to do this, or I guess anybody could, the second to the last bullet, don't, sometimes somebody might grab onto a vehicle and, you know, sort of be sort of towed by um, that. You can't, you can't do that by law on a bicycle. Um, you know, if you have a bicycle made for one, like that photo right there, you can't have two people on the bike. That's against the law. Probably children are the ones um, the most doing that. You know, somebody might be on the, um, sitting on the handlebar like younger kids. It's technically against the law to do that. The last point um, I mentioned, you know, don't only uh, by law, don't have any earbuds in as, as far as I'm concerned. You know, if you're riding your bike, focus on, on riding your bike, enjoy it. Um, but, but try to follow, well, follow the laws and abide by some of these tips we're giving you. Next. All right. Well, many thanks to all of our panelists for sharing that great information. Many thanks to Hop Hog Library for hosting us. And thank you for attending and watching. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out directly to either Cindy or you can send your questions to me and I'll make sure that we get them to the team. Um, and we just have a few more resources for you. Um, our Walk Safe Long Island website is where you can find our calendar of upcoming events, um, virtual, and we are working on some in-person events that are coming up, so be sure to check that out. Um, the New York State Governor's Traffic Safety Committee is a great resource, as well as the New York State Department of Transportation website, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and the Institute for Traffic Safety and Research that has a lot of great crash data if that's something that you're interested in learning more about. Um, so once again, thank you so much for joining us.